Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we have Raja Khalid, who is going to be our guest to talk about DNS security. Raja, if you want to give a quick introduction about yourself and your experience in this area for our listeners and where they can find you if they have any questions for follow-up. Sure. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Raja Khalid. I am a sales engineer at Zscaler. Uh, I've been in the cybersecurity space for about six years uh, and been with Zscaler since January. So, Welcome to the show. Thanks, Andy. So when it comes to DNS security, this topic can kind of be broken down into several subtopics, and it's very, very large. Yes. So I want to just kind of premise our show and say that we're not going to talk about everything that encompasses DNS security. When people say DNS security, there's things like reputation filtering and DNS inspection, like maybe SSL inspection but also securing the protocol of DNS because DNS by nature is unencrypted and insecure. Yeah. So there's stuff like DNSSEC or DNS over HTTPS, often abbreviated as DOH. And then the new one, DNS over TLS or DOT, and soon to happen is TLS 1.3, right? And so all those things encompasses this major topic of DNS security. So we'll probably more focus on the reputation filtering and inspection and visibility for DNS. And we'll save the security of the protocol on the channel for a later topic. We may mention some things, but that is a massive topic in itself. So when we talked previously on the pre-call, Raja, you had talked about kind of four components of security being email, web, AV, and firewalls. And now that things are in the cloud and we're working from home, that that model doesn't work as it used to, right? Yeah. So how do you think people can move to a more modern standpoint of securing their traffic, specifically with DNS? Yeah, so, you know, that's that's what we used to do as, you know, I was more of a general consultant, right? And, and that's how we approached it, is that when we would sit down with a client, we would cover these four main bases, and then, you know, authentication and SIM were kind of, you know, auxiliaries to that, right? They were kind of the next steps. And you used to always talk about, okay, well, let's talk about your location. Let's talk about your data center. Let's talk about, you know, building that castle, that moat, building that security, because everything was in house, right? Um, and that's how, you know, everything was structured. It was just, it was a lot easier to have that conversation um, with customers because not only did we have a plan, right, but everything was, for them was in, where they knew it was to be, right? Um, and, you know, now, I mean, that's completely changed. And COVID has, has definitely, you know, accelerated that. Um, I mean, I used to always joke with people and say that, you know, I'm a millennial and I'm going to tell you right now, downtowns are going away. Like, I could not stand being anywhere. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I had to work from home, right, early on. And it just, and, and why, and, you know, most people are extroverts and want to have that, that, you know, ability to go into an office or go into something. But, you know, even companies are realizing like, hey, you know, spending a ton of money for an entire floor uh, of downtown office space just doesn't make sense, right? So maybe, you know, things like, like a WeWork or, or like, you know, being able to have some smaller offices. But then again, that presents challenges, right? So not only do you have users that are going to be working literally from anywhere, you have applications that are now 
developed in the cloud that are you know hosted in the cloud. There's some stores in the cloud. You have um, SaaS applications. Um, so you know your data is not where it used to be, right? And it's no longer in the data center. It's no longer protected. Um, same thing when it comes to um, you know just so so now you have this dynamic where you're like what do I do right like and, and so and and we tried to put a bandaid over it right we were just like okay all right you have these remote locations um, you know and there's definitely industries where they've always had you know stores or they've had you know multiple locations where they're like well we got to figure something out right because we cannot buy an entire security stack just for every single store or every single warehouse or every single location. So what do we got to do? Well, the only thing that we could come up with was like, well, let's just, you know, we'll, we'll do this MPLS tunneling and we'll tunnel everything back to the data center. And, you know, we'll have an entire security stack sitting at your data center and everything will go in and out of there. Great. But the cost of that is tremendous, right? And it's not the greatest user experience either, but it was, you know, secure, right? And then you started coming out with, you know, next gen firewalls that were a little bit, you know, smaller, more robust. You could possibly do some things from remote locations and go direct to the internet, but you still were, I mean, it was not, you could not do SSL inspection entirely from that. Um, You, you know, so definitely you had to send some traffic back to the data center, right? Um, And then, you know, so, so that was, you know, kind of this progression is like, you know, oh my God, now I have all these applications in Azure AWS. Well, now I got to build like firewalls and I got to build an entire security stack there, right? So um, it it just, and and we're still kind of in that phase where we're like, well, what do we do? How do we handle this, right? And and you see that with Gartner came out with SASE, came out with Zero Trust. So they are trying to get people to think differently. And that's what Zscaler does. And that's what I think is the most effective approach is take the user and make the user put security as close to them as possible and leverage a service that can provide you that full security stack without you having to backhaul anything to a data center, backhaul anything to a location. Whether it's a user, it's you know a, a remote location, they can go direct to the internet and have that full security stack available to them while not reducing user experience. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. When I when I think about the struggles of, from a security standpoint, of teams trying to secure network traffic, yeah. and how you're kind of explaining people working from home and having to backhaul that traffic to a data center, I think about the the new triad that Gartner came out called the SOC visibility triad and it's EDR SIM and then NDR network detection and response. And all of that requires visibility into the network traffic. And when you're off prem and you're going direct to the internet, if you don't have a solution like other than full tunneling all of your traffic to a data center, you don't have visibility into that. So then you're depending on, say, if I went to a malicious site and then I downloaded something, all of a sudden the one thing that I have is maybe my endpoint protection solution to prevent me from doing something, right? I have no other protection. And so that's the challenge I think that most organizations may be facing because you either sacrifice availability and network congestion by full tunneling your traffic back and, you know, seeing all of that traffic and knowing it's secure, like you said, Mm -hmm. or you do something like split tunnel, you let them go direct out to the internet for non-corporate resources, but then you have zero visibility when they're off-prem and who knows where they're going to and what they're doing, right? Yeah. So that's, that's what I think of. So now, now Andy, so now just, you know, picture, you know, a company like where you've deployed, have you personally ever deployed like a DNS server? I have. Yeah. Okay. And where did you put it? Usually on-prem, like in a data center or hosted in 
a cloud okay. infrastructure with a a point to point. Now, now, is it the in the internal network in the DMZ? Where do you put it? Internal network. Okay. So now, like, let's just let's just you know, I like to do practical examples, right? Mm-hmm. Just so say I, you know, I have you on speed dial, right? And I type in one, and I you answer the phone, but I don't verify it's you, right? I just say, hey, bro, hey, can you uh, tell me the address to uh, Adam's party that, that's going on tonight, mm-hmm. right? And you say, all right, bro, I'm going to text you back, right, the address. Yep. And you text me someplace that's in Southside Chicago that I'm, you know, there's going to be five guys waiting to rob me, right? So one, I didn't say, hey, Andy, is this you? And by the way, you know, when you were, you know, 12 years old, did you, you know what I'm saying? Like verifying, using DNSSEC, right? Mm-hmm. To verify it's you, first off. Second off, you know, you either responded to me with the information that you had that was bad, or you reached out to somewhere else to find that, right? Right. You yourself, and I had no visibility of that. I did not even check and say, hey, do you even know, right? You yourself said, all right, let me go find out and figure it out and go ask somebody, right? And that person might have given you bad information, right? So that is where a lot of this comes into play, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So when it comes to DNS security, it's not only could I potentially be directed to a malicious place on the internet, right? It could also be my DNS servers under attack, right? My DNS server could have been compromised. So I need to have visibility from me to the resource, right? And I need visibility for my DNS server as well. So when my DNS server is making those requests outbound, I need to be able to see that, right? And I can't just, you know, oh, hey, by the way, you know, it's CNN.com. It's going to be totally cool, right? Because even CNN, even Yahoo, all these things have those content delivery networks, have those, um, you know, spaces for people to buy little ad spaces, right? And if you're not inspecting all of it, then, and you're just going, hey, it's CNN, we're cool, then you have, you're not doing, you're, you're not securing, right? Right. And then not only that, but on top of it, when it comes to inspection, there's a lot of services that need to utilize or do utilize DNS for other purposes, right? Which we call DNS tunneling. Right. Mm-hmm. So so now you have these services that and a lot of them are legit. Right. But even hackers are like, OK, well, if you could do it, I could do it, too. Right. So let me involve a malicious payload or let me do data exfiltration or let me utilize this protocol that your firewall is going to be like, oh, it's DNS. We're cool. Let's utilize that to do command and control servers or to do data exfiltration. Let's, you know, and they, and they do that, right? So if you don't have something that can inspect that traffic and actually go further and actually start to apply some machine learning as well and say, Hey, you know, this is something, a tunnel that is not, not a typical, right? Cause there's, there's those out there where you're like, all right, this is known bad DNS tunneling. We know that, you know, hackers typically utilize this, right? But if you don't analyze that traffic further, and understand, hey, there's something here that's not okay, right? Mm-hmm. Then, then you're, then you're susceptible to attack, right? Um, but that's, I mean, you know, again, DNS security is a is a piece of it, but it's not all of it, right? And that's the thing. So you obviously want to start with that. You want to make sure that, hey the resource that I'm requesting is the resource that I'm getting and that I'm actually asking for a legitimate resource in the first place. And I myself am not compromised and, you know, my request either wasn't changed or I myself am not, you know, uh, being forced to request something, you know, evil. Um, you know, there's that. I need to make sure that I have that visibility into that traffic. So, but beyond that, once you get beyond that, then you need to start applying an understanding 
IPS, malware, advanced threat. There's so much more that goes into it to make sure that any resource, no matter where that user is, when they are going to it, they are going to a safe place. There's no data exfiltration. They can use their resource, be done with their resource, and, and be done, right? So you said a lot there, and one of the things that I picked up on is, again, kind of the topic of what I was kind of hammering is visibility. Mm -hmm. And you, you talked about inspection yeah. and SSL inspection is sometimes a debated topic in the security world because, you know, there's ways that some vendors implement it where they actually downgrade the security between when they insert their certificate in between to inspect them. Like maybe, their certificate is only, you know, TLS 1.1 or something like that. And they literally downgrade your encryption protocol when they insert their certificate. And there's some ethical questions that pop up when you're inspecting sites that have content that you as an employer may not want to know about. So what is your take, you know, personally or as a professional on SSL inspection and should people do it in your recommendation? So I believe it's like 75 or 80% of attacks now use some sort of encryption. And if you're a hacker and you're not using encryption, then it it's almost stupid because, you know, why not? One, most people are not doing it or they're not doing it really well, right? So your firewall, right, whether you bought a Cisco, Palo, no matter what it is, you have to buy a two times, three times bigger box just to do full SSL inspection. So if you're a hacker and you know this, then, I mean, you're going to use some form of encryption, right? So... Being able to do SSL inspection is absolutely vital if you are going to maintain a secure posture. Otherwise, you are leaving gaps in your security. I understand there's ethical concerns. There's ethical concerns with a lot of things, right? But, you know, you have to have that visibility, right? Yeah. Um, and again, I mean, that you know, that starts to get into like other stuff too, like, you know, nation states and what they're allowed to see and, and different things. But like, I don't want to open that can of worms, but you know, from an organization's perspective, you know, that is your, that, I mean, that is, you know, your crown jewels, right? So your job is to protect it no matter what the cost is. Now, obviously you don't want to do anything completely out, you know, outside of the realm or completely unethical, but breaking open packets, you know, checking to see what's in those packets and then sending them on there. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's actually extremely valuable to do. And the fact that Zscaler can do it and do it really, really well is one of the reasons why customers go with Zscaler is because they're like, wait, I don't have to buy this massive ginormous box that's going to be worthless in three, five years anyways. Like, and I can do it, you know, in the cloud, which is co being constantly updated. And I could do it at a hundred percent without any latency issues. Sign me up. Like I'm ready to go, you know? So, and that's part of the reason why I joined Zscaler and why I loved Zscaler before was because of that story. You know, the way they designed it so that you can actually do SSL inspection without having to worry about, oh my God, how much is this going to take off the box, right? Which a lot of the times was what, like 80% of the box? Like mm -hmm. you would be like, oh my God, I can't even, you know, so, but yeah. Yeah, so what about um, categories of inspection that you may not want to inspect? Does Zscaler have the ability to, yeah, say, definitely. filter out health-related yeah. categories or legal or something like yeah. that? 
Yeah. And you can, you know, so, and we just had a 6.1 release as well. So, uh, with that, you can do, you know, look, you could do based on location groups, uh, departments, you can, you can make, ex, you know, what you want to and what you don't want to inspect. So you can get pretty granular there. So when it comes to filtering, kind of shifting gears a little bit, there's category filtering and then also reputation filtering, two different things, I think, when it comes to security, because sometimes category filtering, like you talked about, there's malware and malicious sites, but there's also other things like pornography and violence, some sort of legal things that you may want to know about, as well as cloud storage. You know, that's a big one these days, being able to exfiltrate data to different cloud storage providers that aren't managed by your organization. And then reputation filtering, which is more, you know, based on the reputation of the site. And so um, how does Zscaler kind of handle all of that? So uh, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so so the first thing is that we, like I mentioned, we are not going to say, oh, hey, it's CNN and you're good, right? Um, what Zscaler does is so in the advanced threat section, we actually do what's called a uh, page risk, okay? And so what that is is that's really a um, – it takes two things. It takes the domain risk and the page risk. And it's basically this algorithm that we've created that does real-time content inspection and of everything, content delivery networks, you know, and it'll take things like domain reputation, like uh, how long has this domain been, um, you know, live, et cetera. It'll take all those things, but it'll take it as a, as a, as a piece of the overarching um, view into what, where does this sit when it comes to the risk that it's providing to your organization, right? So we're not just going to say, oh, okay, hey, it's CNN.com. We're going to take all of the CDNs. We're going to take, you know, a uh, full view of that, put that into the algorithm. It's going to generate a score. And then you as the organization can set where you are comfortable and where your risk is, right? So if you put it at zero, it's going to block everything. If you put it at 100, it's going to, you know, allow everything, right? And it has guidelines and, hey, recommended is like 35 or something. So anything above that, it'll, it'll you know, uh, block it. Anything below that, it'll, it'll allow. So, um, so that's, that's how we do it. And that's from a, you know, again, you know, just focusing on reputation just does not does not work, right? Uh, because of all those content delivery networks, because of all the the additional content that's in it, because of the potentially fact that you know a legitimate website may be um, you know hacked, etc. Right. So so that's one thing. Um, now, when it comes to um, URL category filtering, um, so that. You know, URL filtering, I mean, that's that's your general basic stuff that every secure web gateway has to have, right? And you can do that with Zscaler based on users, groups, departments, locations. I mean, you could do it however you want. So, like, for me, I've done it for my kids, right? Make sure they can't go to any porn, can't do any gambling sites, can't do any anything crazy. And I can also set even the specific request methods that I want to allow or block and I can even specify the different protocols as well. So if I'm because Zscaler is a proxy, I could do URL category filtering for DOH. I could do it for FOH. I could do it for uh, HTTPS, for you know um, tunnel SSL, SSL. So I have a lot of options when it comes to what I can actually inspect when it comes to Zscaler. Um, so I think that covered what you were mentioning. Was there, or do you want me to kind of keep going with some of the other features? Well, just as a side note real quick, 
um, cool. for anybody who wants to benefit from at least some of that capability from a home perspective without a whole lot of care and feeding. And, and I don't know if you can talk about this or not, but I've noticed, so I have an Eero Wi-Fi system and there's the Eero Secure Plus offering that's a paid offering and it's like hundred bucks a year or something, but it's literally like flip a switch and it blocks all your ads, flip another switch and it can block your children from accessing things you don't want them to access. And I've noticed that it's actually powered by Zscaler on the back end. Um, and so that's just been really really great for, you know, I do that at work all day long. So it's nice at home. It's more just a set it and forget it thing of flip a switch. And I'm getting kind of a lot of that same capability you talk about as far as filtering out low reputation sites or, or malicious um, endpoints or, or anything like that. And I don't have to do anything. I just had to turn on a switch. So I, I yeah. love that capability. And, and again, I don't know if that's something Eero lets you guys talk about, but anybody who's kind of seen what's going on behind the scenes has noticed who's, who's behind the curtain. So it's good stuff. Yeah. Total side note, a, but yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and, there's additional things I can do when it comes to four specific cloud applications too, right? So I can tell, I can have my kids go to Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. Or allow them to do, you know, I mean, they're not on LinkedIn right now, but I mean, I can have them go to specific cloud applications, but I can prevent certain actions, right? So I can prevent them from, you know, posting or from uploading or from any, so there's really granular uh, controls when it comes to, um, you know, that, that whole cloud app security piece. Um, you know, so, so whether it's, you know, instant messaging applications or, you know, uh, those streaming applications, I can get pretty granular when it comes to, Hey, you know, I want them to be able to go to YouTube, but not be able to post content, which they should not be doing anyways. Right. Mm -hmm even though they all want to be YouTube stars nowadays. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, that's one of the things that I think is kind of unique to Zscaler because in the default offering of the internet security product, you have these CASB-esque features that are built in, but you also have a CASB offering yes. that's completely separate. But yes. in the internet security, which is kind of what we're talking about here, the filtering and the inspection and mm -hmm. and the URL um, and malware downloads, all of that stuff that's kind of built into your internet security um, product, it has these CASB-esque features that, you, that you're just talking about now where you can prevent certain actions from being done to certain cloud applications, which I, I think is pretty cool. Yeah, and there's tenancy restriction to that too, right? So if I want to say, hey, on your corporate Gmail, you could do whatever you want, but for your personal Gmail, you should not be, you know, doing certain things. I can do that with Zscaler as well by creating, you know, hey, this is my corporate tenant. They can do whatever they want. Outside of that, you know, if they go to Gmail, they're, they're not allowed to do certain things. So, Same thing for OneDrive. So OneDrive gets in OneDrive gets into the Casby aspect of it, right? Um, but yeah, so um, when it comes to when it comes to um, Casby, right? There's two aspects of it. There's inline, and there is um, the the Casby, which is the out of bound out of band Casby piece, right? And and this is the thing that always bothers me that. And actually, when I was first learning cybersecurity, um, you know, I'm I'm at Zscaler now, so I, you know, but I still got to give props to McAfee for this, okay? Because I started off as one of those McAfee partner specialists, just helping out with McAfee stuff. But their training was phenomenal, okay? They broke down DLP like I have never, and ever since then, I, you know, the way that they explained it. I've really helped a lot of customers because it gets so confusing to a lot of customers. They're like, dude, we have no idea. I mean, you know, you say you do D DLP, but I have Vontu sitting, you know, and Vontu does, you know, USB drives and it does like, so where, what, what the heck is, you know, what is CASB? What is DLP? What is all this? And, you know, that's the thing is that understanding because, I mean, DLP is a beast, Right. There's prevention pieces of it. There's monitor pieces of it. There's the cloud pieces of it. 
And now you're talking about CASB, you're talking about DLP endpoint, right? So there's, there's so much there to unpack. And, you know, people need to realize that out of band CASB is for data at rest, right? Is there malware? Is there sensitive content sitting in my OneDrive, sitting in my SharePoint, sitting somewhere in my applications that I don't know about? I'm not looking to block. I'm not looking to do, I might, I might remove it. I might want to quarantine it. I might want to remove sharing from it, but it's not going to be real time. It's going to be a scan. It's going to be, you know, every hour, every couple hours, it's going to scan the data, you know, or when new data comes in, it's going to scan it and it's going to test that data and to see if anything's there. Inline CASB, right, which is kind of what we're talking about is more along the lines of, hey, if somebody is doing something in real time, I want to block or allow or, you know, change some things up or make sure they can do certain actions, but not other actions, right? So that's more in line, right? And then that also comes into play when it comes to DLP, right? Prevention is I want to prevent, if somebody is doing something in real time, I want to block it from happening, Whereas monitor is like, okay, let it happen, but I want to know about it later, right? And then you have the DLP endpoint side, which is a whole other gamut, but it's like, you know, USB devices, things like that on the endpoint, you know, is there data that's flowing out, right? So a little bit of a side into the CASB space there. Um, Other vendors are in this space as well, right? Like there's a lot of vendors out there that kind of do the web security gateway, Palo Alto, um, Zscaler, yeah. uh, Forcepoint, Cisco Open DNS, Umbrella, yeah. you know, Cloudflare, Cloudflare does some DNS security as well, and Quad9, and so those are some other options out there. So what, you know, kind of sets Zscaler apart from all of those other ones? So the key thing is, right, that, Again, we're, we're in this new dynamic, right, where we want to secure users um, and from wherever they are, right? And we want to be able to protect our applications wherever they reside, right? So now everybody's trying to come up with this platform that includes firewall, that includes IPS controls, that will include the traditional security web gateway uh, include, you know, anti-malware, advanced threat, um, and CASB, right? DLP, et cetera. Everybody's trying to do it and everybody's trying to add pieces and parts here and there. Some people have come from the CASB side, trying to add the proxy. Some people are, you know, started as firewalls, trying to add, uh, web controls, et cetera. Um, the thing that sets Zscaler apart is that we designed ourselves as a proxy. And if you're a cybersecurity guy, then you remember back in the day when Palo Alto was like, oh, the proxy is dead, it's over, you know, it's done, right? But we designed the proxy and, and, you know, this is a little bit of a history behind it, right? Because the proxies were slow. There was no way to do security and proxy together. And as a, as a matter of fact, we had a conversation like five years ago with Bluecoat and they were like, no, there's always going to be customers that want to do security and proxy separate, right? Because you just can't do it fast. And we were like, well, what about Zscaler? And it, they were just oblivious, okay? So like Zscaler has designed a proxy by re-architecting the TCP IP stack so that they can do security inspection really, really fast, including SSL encryption or decryption, including um, you know advanced malware, et cetera, et cetera, right? And we also have sandboxing capabilities as well. Now that obviously takes a few minutes. That's true with any sandbox, but that's what sets Zscaler apart is that we have this full portfolio that can do a lot, but that's easy to deploy, easy to manage, and 
is a proxy architecture that's specifically designed um, for availability, making sure that your you know, users have quick access to, uh, to the resources that they need, which includes DNS optimization. When I think about security, you, we always talk about security in layers, and I'm curious because there's other solutions. You, you talked about sandboxing, and so who would hit it first, and, and why would you want something else? If I have an endpoint solution that also does sandboxing or other type of inspection, you know, why would I need another layer of security there to also do it again, right? Yeah. So um, in in a SOC, right? Um, so I used to be at Splunk, and we used to talk about SOAR and Phantom. And most organizations had three or four different sandboxes. You would have Joe's, San, Joe's Cloud Sandbox or anomaly threat detection, or there would be, you know, the more intelligence that you can leverage, the better off that you're going to be, right? That's, that's one thing. Second, if you're doing it at the network layer, right, that means it hasn't gotten to your endpoint yet. Now, if your endpoint has to do sandbox, that means it bypassed the network. So if you're talking about doing security in layers, you know, let our intelligence check it out first. Let us look at it. And then if it bypasses us, then your endpoint can, can look at it as well, right? So for use cases for Zscaler, yeah. what, if I was a customer and I'm looking at a, a particular thing to try to fill up, uh, specifically, you know, maybe the, remote worker or something like that that's at home and I want to see their visibility. What other use cases or where do you see Zscaler fitting in as a security product into uh, different organizations? So one thing is security, right? Obviously, the way that we've designed our proxy um, we are going to be the most secure networking solution, networking security solution out there, right? Um, I have no um, reservations about saying that. I truly believe that, you know, the reason why I'm at Zscaler is because of that, um, is the fact that we can secure your users and your data no matter where it sits and no matter where that they no matter where they are okay um, second thing is if you're talking about SD WAN or local breakouts right the thing is you need to be able to have a complete security stack ready to go you need to be able to have that available to you without you saying, oh, well, I might as well have just sent it to my data center. Like, why am I using you guys, right? Zscaler has over 150 data centers throughout the world ready to go for a customer. So you're not having to backhaul or send anything, you know, God only knows where, right? Well, we only have three or four data centers or, or, hey, our data centers sit in AWS and Azure. So our service will be up, but we don't know about AWS and Azure, right? Or, um, you know, by the way, you might have to bring us down for maintenance because, you know, the way that we're structured, uh, when you have to do updates, you have to bring us down, right? Our data centers are custom designed, built for you, throughout the world so that no matter where your user is sitting, it's going to go to the nearest data center um, for that entire security stack uh, and out, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing is O365. So, you know, Microsoft always <laughs> loves to like, you know, 
make the world adopt stuff. And then everybody's like, okay, that's great. But how am I supposed to do this? Like, you know, my internet traffic just went up like 10 X. Like, like, don't you guys realize that every, everything that my users were doing on their own computer now has to go through the internet. Like, you know, but Microsoft's like, oh, we don't care. And by the way, oh, we want that traffic to come directly to us. And, you know, it shouldn't be backhauled. So that's actually why Microsoft loves Zscaler too, is because Zscaler says, okay, cool. We are going to peer with Microsoft in data centers, right? Equinix data centers. And... Not only that, but you can either completely bypass that traffic and use Microsoft tools, or you can use Zscaler tools. So if you really want to make sure that your customers have no latency whatsoever, there is a one-click configuration for all O365 traffic that will bypass SSL, bypass everything, and send it directly to, to, to Microsoft. Nice. Yeah. I'm wondering... Maybe you might know something about this, or this question may come up when you talk to potential customers because I'm thinking about companies that I've been at and different country restrictions, Yeah, perhaps maybe with, say, Europe and some of their privacy laws or uh, if people have manufacturing or offices in China and they have you know specific networking requirements. How does... Zscaler kind of handle those regional restrictions. So let's not talk about China. <laughs> That's an, that could be an entire hour conversation and it's in and of itself. However, I will say that when it comes to China, Zscaler is the best solution to go with. Hands down. We have the most experience. Now, the reason why I don't want to get into it is because every situation is different. Every customer is different. And there's caveats that, you know, again, it's a whole can of worms, right? But Zscaler is the number one product when it comes to anything China. Now, the other thing is like, okay, I'll give you a prime example. Saudi Arabia, right? They don't want their data to go through Israel, right? Zscaler can make sure that it is only going to specific data centers, so the pack file that's part of um, the within the application, the Zscaler application, it can direct you to either the closest data center or to a specific data center or keep you within a specific geographic region. Okay, so and that's part of what we do with China, but you know that's for G, you know, especially like Canada, right? Like Canada has weird laws too now, right? So like. Everything has to stay within Canada. So you can force and make sure that everything stays within uh, Canadian data centers. So you're customizing that pack file and, and storing it yes. within the application. Yep. Nice. So we briefly talked about VPN being kind of one of the conversation starters for this and the issue that companies are having because People are working from remote locations and not on-prem anymore and and how VPNs, you know, some solutions are not scalable because as probably companies found out when the pandemic hit and you sent home 80, 90% of your company and all of a sudden the firewalls that are terminating your VPN connections are getting overloaded from all those different connections – and oh, by the way, you know, you only have one office that has that VPN connection. You know, how does uh, Zscaler handle that? Because I know you guys have a product as well that is separate from the security portion of it that is VPN esque, I'll say. Well, so what we say is just get rid of VPN, right? So one is obviously the, the limitation on the box itself to handle the connections, the second is is and let's go back to a practical example okay so it's like a bouncer at a club and you've you know a person who's already had five or six drinks and shows up and says 
let me in, right? And he's like, go right on in. You can go anywhere you want, right? And this guy goes and creates havoc on the first floor, on the second floor. He's partying up on the third floor, bar- bothering all the private parties, etc. right? That's exactly what VPN is. It's like, hey, here's an IP address. Just come on into my network. Like, you're good to go, right? I trust you. Well, no, right? Like, we don't do that. And, and we believe that there's a completely different way to do that. Okay, so one is we're not going to trust you. You have to authenticate, right? Second thing is that you have to be coming through Zscaler. And what I'm going to do is basically I'm going to put what's called we call app connectors in front of my applications. And they are only going to allow outbound connections to the Zscaler data center. So what the Zscaler data center does is it stitches together the two outbound connections and then creates the ability for the user to access only the application that they need to access without putting them onto the network. Okay. So now you can, you can wildcard it out, which is what a lot of customers do in the beginning, right? Just, Hey, I want to discover what applications are sitting in this Azure, uh, you know, what, what's, what applications are sitting here, right? You can kind of wildcard that out with the, with the app connectors and figure out what users are accessing what applications. And it's literally like a point and click for once you start to figure out what those applications are, you can then start to define those applications and apply policies to them. So it's really easy, really nice. And not only that, but it's always on. You never have to worry about, you know, any, anything other than, the the user having you know making sure that they're authenticated into the zscaler application right and you can set timeout policies as well you can ensure that they re-authenticate you know ever every so often or when they access an, uh, a resource but it's based on the the concept of i'm not going to just let you in and and let you go wherever you want or have any resource you want I need you to go directly only to the application you're ask, asking for, and I'm only going to give you the access to what you're allowed to access. The kind architecture of like, you're describing there is obviously something we're pushing a lot of organizations to adopt, but I can just speak to my specific experience at Microsoft. That is exactly the architecture we're adopting. So a, a change is actually this is the perfect opportunity to make this change where we used to have say a Wi-Fi network that was called MSFT Corp. And you go in and connect to that and you're literally sitting on the corporate network. You can go get to anything that is gone. That doesn't exist anymore. When you go in uh, to a Microsoft office, if you haven't been in in a while as an employee, um, MSFT Corp is gone or it's going away and there's a new MSFT connect. And all that is, is it's just an internet connection. That's all it is. Now, it's it's encrypted, of course, just for Wi-Fi security reasons. But to get to each individual application, now, you know, we might be using different tech than Zscaler, but architecturally, the concept is the same. You're you're going to that app or that app or, or app Y, app Z, app A, and you're gaining access to just it just in time when you need to access it. You're not just bouncing around the entire corporate network anymore. And mm-hmm. I, I think this is an architecture a lot of organizations need to really consider adopting because to your point and i think your analogy about uh the drunk guy in the club or the overserved guy in the club is perfect um as a perfect example of if we can isolate that and, and limit that access we protect a whole bunch of drama from getting unleashed so a i love the analogy b i love the architecture yeah i think it's kind of like doing network segmentation but a lot easier right instead of having to worry about splitting off different subnets and ACLs and and managing all of that, I think it's probably a lot easier just to have these applications and define them by user groups, which is what we're normally used to doing by identities and, and authentication nowadays um, mm-hmm. without having that network experience. Like you, you can, you can probably say it's, is it, required that you have to be a network engineer to architecture um, the the VPN that you're talking about or the ZPA? So, I mean, literally, like, 
I have a domain, right, that has sales dot my domain, research dot my domain, QA, CRM, right? I literally went in there and I just put uh, wildcard.mydomain.com and I started accessing all the different resources and it literally just discovered those applications. And I was able to then start to define those applications and say, okay, this belongs in this application group. This belongs to these users. These users will be able to access it. Um, these are the policies. This and, and literally just it's point and click. It's very, very easy to do. It's really just about once you've discovered your applications, once you know you, what your applications actually are, then at, at that point, then it becomes a corporate, uh, cor- corporate conversation, right? A culture conversation, a, an access conversation. Okay, what are these policies going to look like? You know, who are the people that are going to access this? You know, who are the people that are already accessing this? Um, and then, you know, being able to, you know, group, group those applications or group um, you know, uh, those servers, uh, and then start to create policies around it. So, I mean, very, very easy to do. Um, and, you know, again, very seamless user experience and the user doesn't even know that they're do, you know, even utilizing anything. Right. So, um, cause I remember me having to like, I used to use, you know, Palo Alto go like, Oh man, I can't get to my resource. And then I have to authenticate and go into the VPN and, like, you know, and that was, I mean, that was even better than the Citrix nonsense that was like, you know, that some other users had to use, like, it's just, it's not a fun experience, right? And and most customers can attest to the fact that it's just not, it's not the best solution, but it was the only solution they had at the time, right? Mm-hmm. What about the bad practice or lazy practice, I should say, of accessing an application or a resource by IP address if there wasn't a DNS entry for it. Because I'm lazy. I didn't put it in my in my DNS server. <laughs> or or better or better yet, the um, the application that that the applications that state that uh, your traffic has to be coming from this specific IP address. Yes. IP yes. anchoring. Oh yes. my God! It's just. I mean, it just, you know, again, I mean, like, I, you're, you're taking me to like the conversations that I used to have as a consultant. Like it just, it just, it boggles my mind. Like, you know, like this industry is just, is just nuts. Like when it comes to like, do your homework, like do your, like do what you got to do. And like, like stop, stop crying about China and Russia and everything else. Like, like it, it's it's in, it's it's crazy to me, but it also like reflects the real world, right? Like everyone's scared of the boogeyman, but you know, like, dude, you're make sure that basics. your locks on your doors work. Yeah. Make sure you have you know your your you know like do what you need to do, and get your do your homework, and make sure you have a plan and a playbook, and you know, and then you know. Take take it from there, but like if if you're gonna just be lazy, then what do you expect? Like if you you know like if you're just gonna like, I mean the, you know there's a difference between what we have available to you and just being lazy. And I I just you know yeah just you know and it, it just and then and then it comes to you know and then it, like you know customers will come and they'll be like oh well China and Russia are trying to get us like dude it's probably the dude who's like 15 years old that knows that you're lazy and not doing your job and he's down the street you know or it's the Nigerian prince from Alabama who was smart enough to go buy you know to go buy some Nigerians to do those calls for him like you know like think about it like logically you know what I mean like think about it from you know from who you are and what you need to do and do your job like and then you know take it from there but like don't (laughs) yeah it's just that's so frustrating and i i sorry that's that's opening a whole can of worms for me man yeah i mean i've certainly encountered those situations in my organization when we deployed dpa um i guess my point was is that it is a bad practice 
But sometimes, as we all know in the industry, that yeah. compromises have to be made. Yeah. And ZPA can handle those things, although I usually push back and say, hey, like, give me a DNS entry for this, right? Like, yeah. yes, you can do it, but don't do it <laughs> is really what yeah. I try to say. No, and so, and the thing with, with ZPA is that it doesn't matter, right? You can do IP address. You can do, um, um, you can do um, uh, FQDN. You can do whatever, and that's fine. That's totally fine. And that uh, the thing is, Zscaler is not going to uh, expose that to the world. Right. So we're just going to give you some made up, you know, hundred dot sixty four dot whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's not going to be that that IP address is not going to get exposed to the world. My my point is just from a laziness perspective, because you mentioned it, you know, when it comes to, you know, what customers can do is just make sure you're 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 crossing your your, your T's and dotting your I's wherever you can. Right. Like. Zscaler is a phenomenal solution. Then there's a ton of phenomenal things that are out there, but like, just make sure that you do everything you possibly can do to make it, you know, to do the basics, right? Yep. So, yep. Adam, do you have any final thoughts? <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. so, Raja. I mean, just pa pa like passing advice, right? If you are a SOC or a cybersecurity team, it really sucks, but do the homework. Do the writing out. Do the governance. It's, it's horrible. It takes you back to ninth grade, you know, writing essays and doing papers. It's, it's, it's the worst crap ever, but you got to do it. Understand what industry you belong to. Understand your actual threats, right? Don't just start screaming Russia and China. Right. Like, yeah, obviously. Right. If they're if they're not doing that and we're not doing that to them, then, you know, clearly we, we shouldn't be, you know, where we are. Right. But focus on what you need to do as an organization and the safeguards that you need to put in place and do that analysis, do the quantitative, do the qualitative, understand that. So when a vendor comes to you and they want to sit down and talk to you, then you can actually put metrics together and you can actually go to your higher ups and say, this is what they're providing and this is what they're going to do to mitigate. Right. And so many people don't do that. And it's so frustrating. And even from a vendor's perspective where they're just come in and be like, oh, well, we can do this, 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 this. Well, what does that do for a customer? How are you helping? What are you mitigating? What problems are you solving? And that's, you know, so I just, I feel like people need to do their due diligence and really work hard to, um, to make sure they have that on lockdown before they even start looking at vendors. Yeah. Understanding what your risks are as an organization. Yeah. yeah absolutely. That's good advice. Well, Raja, thank you so much for your time tonight. It was very, very educational uh, to learn about all of this. If our listeners have any follow-up questions, where can they find you? Uh, do you want me to email, phone? I mean... <laughs> uh, so social I mean, media, if you're on it, or LinkedIn. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, my LinkedIn is pretty locked down. I'm pretty sure I don't have anybody that, um, but you can, I mean, you can, you can always email me. Um, sure. it's, uh, you know, the first, um, it's R Khalid at zscaler.com. So R Khalid at zscaler.com. <laughs> All right. We'll put that in the show notes so that if anyone has questions, they can reach out to you. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, and if, there are anybody that are hackers. They're like, well, we already know your address and pretty much everything else about you. So you don't got to put anything in the show notes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Well, that's our show for this week. As always, Adam and my contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any follow-up questions or security topics you want us to talk about, 
Thanks for joining, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.